So today I am very fortunate to be joined by the one and only James Bailey, who has recently written his first novel, The Flip Side, a debut novel. And it's fair to say it's doing pretty darn well. Um, I'm going to jump straight in with some reviews. Miranda Dickinson, the best-selling author of Searching for a Silver Lining, said, It's amazing. It's joyous. It's like finding yourself in the middle of the warmest, funniest, most amazing romantic comedy you've ever come across. And James Bailey is definitely a writer to watch. Not only that, James, and I know you're incredibly humble, so you're not going to like me saying this, but um, your book was also rated five out of five by Waterstones. And you've been the number one book on Apple Books for your debut novel. And it's now being translated I just got to catch my breath. Being translated into nine <laughs> languages. This, this doesn't happen. You write a book, the first one you write, you put it out there, and it's doing this amazingly well. What, what, what's going on? This is mad. Well, more importantly, we, we want to get Ed Blanker's review. What does Ed Blanker <laughs> say about it? When a friend says, I'm writing a book and I'm going to send it to you and have a read, then you normally think, oh, great, if this is awful, this is going to be so painful. And I've got to say, yeah, wonderful. And I was delighted to, be, to actually really enjoy it, which made coming back to you and saying, well done, like, this is unreal. How have you done this? Even easier. So thank you for just making, making it easy to be honest. I've got so many questions to ask you. The first one, just for everyone else who hasn't read this, what's the book about? Yeah, well, firstly, I think I'm going to tell them to stop the print in the books. We need that quote on the front now. <laughs> um, just need to call up the publicist straight away. Um, yeah. I only yeah. charge per <laughs> word, it's fine. <laughs> um, so the flip side is about J Josh, who is a man in his 20s. Um, he's not had the best start to the year. He's just broken up with his girlfriend in like the worst possible way and proposed on the London Eye. She said no. They have another 29 minutes on the London Eye um, still to go. Um, so he's having a bit of a course of life crisis. He has to move back home with his parents. I mean, he loses his job. Obviously, he's, he's broken up with his girlfriend. Um, he decides to flip a coin for every choice he's going to make for the year, um, hoping to find himself, hoping to find love. And the book just kind of follows what happens to him on this journey. Now, the idea for for the coin toss, as you mentioned, where did that come from? Because this is something very unique, which in, to, just to, to, to highlight, it was something that when, I, when you first described it to me, I thought it could potentially be a bit hammy and a bit forced or contrived. Thankfully, it wasn't. And it was used with great effect that there were moments when the coin toss was happening. And I really thought, I, I need this to go one way. And then when it doesn't, a lot of times it doesn't go the way you think, but then it leads to really interesting circumstances afterwards which is obviously a testament to your writing but what yeah where did it come from this idea so i kind of been writing this book in a different format for a few years you know i'd had notes from university i was writing this book about like a coming of age novel and i wanted it to be about choices but it was missing that the gimmick it needed to link it together yeah. um and then i was watching an episode of house of cards and um Francis Underwood talks about there's an episode about him flipping a coin to make a choice and as I was watching it, I was like that's quite an interesting idea a premise which would work well um and I started researching it, and there are people who do it. I think it dates back I think um it was an early Walt Disney cartoon I think one of the characters did it in that flipped a coin and there's this thing called flippism where people actually do this um and I just thought it'd be a nice idea to have Josh putting all his trust and decisions in fate um, and this kind of, you know, it's obviously a trope used often in rom-coms, fate and destiny, um, but kind of giving it a new spin and yeah, just allowing it to see where Josh's life ends up and where it takes him. Now that you've written the novel, is it something that you would apply in your life? So there was an article actually in the papers a few months ago about a study, I think it's somewhere in the States, and they'd done a study with people tossing a coin for decisions and it basically was saying that they were happier for doing this um so there are people who do it and it apparently works i tried it out a bit when i was writing it just to just try and get into it and see what it'd be like um i found it quite addictive um i used it just for simple decisions nothing too big um, but i could see how it could be quite addictive if you could get into it yeah um, one of the publicity ideas for the book was actually to have me doing this in my own life for a week or a month or so um 
to see how it goes and to write about it. But I was a bit worried I'd end up losing my job or yeah. <laughs> it'll get horribly wrong. So I'm not sure <laughs> in real life if I trust the coin. I'd be curious if this is what you were trying to achieve. But one of the big takeaways I found was that it made me think a lot about, like you're saying, in terms of fate and planning life. And every time I've pl- tried to plan my life in any way, it's it's gone horribly wrong. And when I've tried to just live in terms of serendipity and, and taking the opportunity that's in front of you, as Josh does in the book, that's, that's when wonderful, unexpected things happen. And reading the book reminded me of that. Is that something you were hoping to achieve or is that just a sort of a happy byproduct of, of no, one person yeah. reading it? No, I'm pleased. I'm pleased you took it from the book. Yeah, I think that's definitely what one of the things I was hoping to convey. And I think it's just that, you know, I'm definitely someone who's normally a planner. You know, I like to make my lists. I like to do pros and cons. And you can't really foresee what's going to happen. Sometimes you just, you know, you have to be decisive you have to make a decision. You have to go with it. You know, you can't, you can't predict the future. You're not a fortune teller. Um, so just, yeah, the spontaneity of it. And also just like, I guess it's something I've seen with lots of my peers, lots of friends, certainly people we went to school with who maybe their lives hadn't turned out quite the way they planned 10 years ago. And then you start thinking, oh, was it that choice I made? Should I have gone to a different university? Should I have done a different subject? Should I have taken a different job straight away? Should I have moved somewhere else? And it's very easy to start you know, analysing every decision you make in life when, you know, every little choice, you know, you could go, if I walk this street, if I go that way to this shop, your whole life could change. And the very sliding doors kind of metaphor. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I kind of just wanted to convey that and how maybe just go for it. You know, you can't yeah. really predict where it's going to go. So just live your life in the moment, really. It's so true. And when we, we met, I remember when you were writing the book and we were talking a lot about what what we're doing in our lives what other people we know are doing in our lives and and like you say things are are becoming so unexpected and it's like talking about those reunions that obviously you're very good and and heavily involved in organizing and a lot of people are sort of dreading because they're like my life hasn't gone the way I planned you know I don't have the kids the job the house whatever that I thought but One thing I remember as well is just going back to the coin tossing. When we spoke, you said how you were coming up with different names for the book um, and you've ultimately settled on the flip side. But I thought it'd be worth sharing what some of the other options might have been and maybe why they didn't make it to the final cover. So yeah, so when I, um, so just give you like a brief overview how it works when you're writing a book. So you finish writing a novel and you have to send the novel to an agent, get an agent then sent to the publisher to get the publisher so back when I was trying to find an agent I had this the manuscripts and I sent it to a um, a few agents who I was hoping would represent me and the title I was using back then was Tossa um, which I thought was quite a good title and it certainly you know did its job it caught their attention and I managed to get an agent Um, by the time I saw my penguin penguin weren't so keen on Tossa as a title unfortunately yeah Um, so yeah it took a few a few months and meetings to sort out the title but we went with the flip side which is probably a bit more <laughs> a bit more suitable for the, the supermarkets maybe it might have had a very different audience yeah <laughs> of course it's one thing to say i'm going to write a book and then it's another entirely to actually write it to sit down to spend all the hours come up with the ideas i mean what were the what were the trigger moments for you that went i'm actually going to do this and and how did it start really yeah i think it's as you say, it's quite a, you have to be quite dedicated because you can spend all this time, you know, you can sacrifice weekends, you can miss watching football matches, miss seeing your friends to sit there and write this book. And there's no guarantee that it's going to get anywhere. You know, you could write the greatest novel of all time, but if the right person doesn't look at it, you're not going to get an agent, you're not going to get a publisher, you're not going to get in the shop. So with that mindset, it's quite hard to actually find the dedication. Um, yeah. I think for me, the moment was probably, so I signed up to um, a writing course, a six month writing course with Curtis Brown back in 2018. And I think that's probably the moment for me when I started taking it more seriously, both in terms of I had to pay to go on the course and for six months I had to travel by coach, the 10.30 p.m. National Express coach from London back to Bristol every Monday night. So in terms of time and financial sacrifice, I was kind of like, all right, now this is something I want to pursue, I want to take seriously. Um, and then also on that course, just having other people read your writing, having the confidence from that, from other people enjoying it, 
from talking to agents and other authors and then liking the idea. Yeah, I suppose it's just that idea of you've already spent this many months, years writing it, it'd be a shame not to finish it. Um, but it is that hard, you know, you have to try to get that mindset out of your way, you know, where it could lead nowhere. You have to kind of have confidence in yourself um, to get it done. I found um, a Christmas card from a friend, an old one, I think it was two or three years old um, the other day, and it said inside, like, maybe this will be the year you actually finish writing your novel, right, really sarcastically. Um, so I'm pleased I finally got there and it's all, it's all been done now. When you're talking about this, I mean, you and I reconnected because of one of those Monday night coach journeys. I happened to be in London and coming back that course, yeah. Monday night. I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you were on the coach. And I mean, I feel sorry for everyone else, but we were just nattering away for sort of two yeah. and a half hours from, from London to Bristol on the coach at, you know, middle of the night. And that was, and it was wonderful. And you had just done that course as well. And you had lots yeah. of different book ideas. And it was it's so satisfying, like you say, to see that it's now coming it's come into its own and, and particularly the, I think, the as you say, I think, yeah, I think actually, you know, it's like they say, isn't it? You know, if you want to, you know, lose weight or stop an addiction, you have to like go and say, tell someone you, this is what you're going to do. I think that was kind of the writing, like going on this course and saying, all right, I want to write a novel. This is what I want to do. It kind of makes you do it more because you've kind of told people, you know, I've told you on the coach, yeah. <laughs> whether you're listening to me at 10 30 and the coach probably not i don't know but you know i told you this is what i'm going to do so you kind of have to follow through with it and um yeah i, so I think that helped just yeah and there's a beautiful dedication at the end and, and we'll come more on to that as well about sort of inspirations for the book you mentioned that you you wanted to get a, a dedication. i wanted to bring it up that i was very surprised that i didn't get a dedication because i thought that was quite an important coach journey talk but yeah. you know it, yeah. clearly it had more impact on one of us than the other but you know i won't <laughs> I won't hold it against you. Just um, be careful about, you know, I'll send you the edit of what this really looks like afterwards. <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> just give me 10% of the earnings. It's, it's fine. But speaking of the influences for the book as well, because you write, I mean, it, it was genuinely funny. I mean, lots of people are saying it's a hilarious book. There's a lot of adult humor in there as well and, and relationship and kind of sexual mishaps as well, which I just thought was, and references to that, which was just absolutely, you know, hilarious and, and very relatable. Um, not just saying myself, but you know, one in general. Um, and there's a moment in a restaurant where it's just like, the, you can just see step by step that this is just going to go horribly wrong he doesn't have enough money for the day there's so many times where you just think gosh this is this is real life you know and i just was reading it thinking did this happen to you did this happen to someone you know i mean just talk me through where did you get these ideas for these kind of worst first dates so yeah the, the scene you mention is um mm. so josh is on a date and he's yeah. pretending it's his birthday um to get a discount um i i haven't done that <laughs> but it did come from real life. In um in Paper Chase, they have a membership yeah. scheme. Yes. And you get, I don't know, five pounds, ten pounds off when it's your birthday. Yeah. And I signed up a few years ago in October. My birthday's late November. <laughs> I set up in the, in October. And I was <laughs> buying quite a lot in Paper Chase and I wanted some money off. So I said it was my birthday. You know, didn't think of anything of it at the time, got my five pound voucher. But what happens every year, I go into Paper Chase in October and they always say, Happy birthday. Did you have a nice birthday? What do you do for your birthday? And it takes me a while to work out what they're saying. And because I remember I signed up and told them my birthday's in October. And then it's just me in the shop just trying to go along with this. Like, yeah, I had a lovely birthday. Um, <laughs> Full of pens and paper. and Exactly. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so I'd say kind of the book is like that. Lots of the stuff. There was a good quote someone said the other day, you know, it's all true, but none of it's true. That kind of, you know, lots of it has come from real life moments either for me or friends or family or things I've seen or read about but I don't think any of it's necessarily you know 100% yeah. true none of it has happened as it is in the book um, yeah. kind of like an amalgamation of lots of stories um, yeah that's a very diplomatic answer so that you can... <laughs> oh, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> no slander involved here Josh's friends Jake and Jesse are kind yeah. of very much inspired by friends of mine yeah um other characters are more again an amalgamation of people or maybe like a caricature of some people mix with other people i appreciate it. i don't want to put you in an awkward position but is there anyone coming up to you these days and going is that me <laughs> are so you about um me? in the there's a chapter where josh goes to a school reunion and it's a very fleeting like a one sentence line about an english teacher who set off the fire alarms at his school by smoking 
in the toilets. And um, the day the book came out, I received a text message from an English teacher that we both know. Um, the message simply said, I was vaping, not smoking. <laughs> <laughs> so I think he realized it was about him. <laughs> I think I know who you're talking about there, yeah. <laughs> um, you wrote an article in The Telegraph recently about rom-coms in general, and particularly having a male protagonist in a rom-com. How important was it for you that the protagonist was male? And then how do you feel that that affects the storytelling? So I'm not sure if it is a conscious decision going into it, you know, I wanted a male protagonist. I suppose it was just something which came more naturally to me. Um, yeah. You know, I'm not someone who thinks you can only write, if you're a male, you have to write a male character, a female, female character, or whatever. But I think in this kind of, lots it was very autobiographical. It just made sense to write from a male character who was very similar to me. Um, yeah. But on the wider question, I, I do, I think it's an interesting one. I guess lots of my influences come more from film than books. And in film, we see a lot more rom-coms with a male lead you know going back to the Richard Curtis Hugh Grant films um, and more recently you know it's, it's been done Seth Rogen often plays the character in the rom-coms these days um, whereas in books it seems to be less common you know romantic comedies do tend to be labeled women's fiction chick lit and they tend to be written by a woman, a woman um, with a female um, main character so it's it's been interesting getting lots of feedback from readers saying this makes the change. It's nice to see a male point of view. Um, so yeah, it wasn't something I thought of, you know, necessarily doing it for that reason, but it's been interesting hearing people's reactions to that and maybe seeing that men and women aren't so different when it comes to, to romance and to love. Josh, I feel is in very much in touch with his, uh, his emotions, but then also there's some, his friends make him aware of who he is and they really challenge him and come through for him. So it's interesting how you, you know how people read it but certainly um yeah i think that whole friendship and being able to talk more is certainly you know something very prevalent right now in society mm -hmm. and actually it's something i'm trying to convey more in my second book actually um yeah and i think you know any rom-com you need that group of friends to kind of rally around the main character and support him on his search so you dedicated the book from the beginning to your to your grandparents and there were really truly heartwarming moments about about Josh interacting particularly with his grandpa what was the impact that your grandparents had really on on writing this book for you so, yeah so my grand died earlier this year and um the dedication I put the dedication in and we got the book like a printed copy to her like a few days before she died so it was really nice she got to see that dedication um before she passed away and certainly it was something like she was always someone who is very like proud and of my writing believed in me um when we were clearing out her house a few months ago you know we found some of the old stories i wrote and sent to her you know when i was younger um so certainly again lots of it comes from real life and um but i also just wanted to convey that again the multi-generational kind of aspect of it and how how romance and dating and love has maybe changed and maybe hasn't changed you know in the last 50 plus years um and certainly in this book, like Josh's relationship with his parents is a bit awkward and I, he needed to have someone in his corner. And yeah, the granddad seemed a suitable character to be there to support him along this journey. Mm. This is what, you write beautifully about him and he seems a really strong emotional anchor. Um, and, and as you say, in the world, because you, you, you incorporate references to, to you know, social media and Tinder and so on in a really accessible way. And again, that's incredibly relatable and it feels very modern. But then, like you say, you're bringing it back to the emotional side of what, what are they trying to, why are we using these tools in the first place, but to find that deep connection. And how do you find that personally dating has changed from tinder instagram and, and all the rest i don't really like it um i'm not sure many people do do they i'm not sure there's any it's weird so like i was with my friends the other day and um one of them was saying she'd been asked out and it seemed to cause this like rip amongst the group less than six people obviously about, of course. <laughs> about that she'd been asked out in real life and it was like oh like what was wrong with him well, why why would this happen and it seems like such a weird thing now to think that someone going up to someone in a bar and asking someone out when they were so used to just being on tinder hinge 
Bumble, whatever, you know, those dating apps. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I, you know, I, I've written a romantic comedy, so I'm definitely a romantic and I've written a romantic comedy about someone going on an absurd search for someone he, he meets uh, once. Um, and I had to be careful to try and get the right vibes of that without making him seem like a complete stalker. <laughs> but I, I, I wanted to convey the message and hopefully it comes across that, you know, people do want that romance, I think. I, I think there's something a bit miserable about when it comes to like the most exciting thing is, you know, super liking someone on Tinder or sliding someone's DMs. It's, it's uh, you know, that's the maximum romance that we can have now. It seems a bit sad. Um, you know, you don't necessarily have to search around Europe for someone. <laughs> but, you know, maybe there's a middle ground. I think um, we can all take a leaf out of Josh's book that we definitely need to make more of an effort because yeah. he goes above and beyond to, yeah, yeah. to, find, to find love. But I, I don't know, what about you? So I've, I've come and gone from them in the past. I've sort of, I've logged on at times and I went on a series of dates a few years ago and thought that they weren't that successful because they weren't creating what's a very fun moment, which is that spark, um, like you say. But then I found the more that I've recently come back to them and, you know, have to say that I've made real connections with them, which was really unexpected. But I think because I approached them in a different way, not, not that I was accepting more that, okay, the way you meet is maybe less romantic, but you can still build a strong friendship and relationship through them by the apps help to create the opportunity to build that relationship. So I've been converted, I would say, whereas in the past I was very sort of like, oh no, this is not sort of true love in a digital age. You're just sort of ticking the boxes and the filters, which I get a lot of people are, are doing. But at the same time, re personally, I found it refreshing to have the opportunity to meet people who I wouldn't necessarily bump into or particularly with lockdown and COVID and everything like that, you know, wouldn't have the opportunity to necessarily meet face to face. So I think that they've helped bring people together, but it's like any tool of social media, right? We could, I'm sure, debate this for hours, but it's, it's how you use it and how you approach it. And, and it's not right for everyone because some people look at it from, for a sort of a, a, a I have, I'm a kid in a candy store. I've got so many options and then they just cycle through people and then that becomes incredibly damaging or but then I think if I know a lot of stories of people who have actually found love and gone on to, you know, have kids and, and married and that, that sort of made me think twice, maybe this could work. Um, I think as you say, though, is that um, so many options, it kind of, that's again, what I kind of wanted to reflect in the novel about this element of choice. And now we're getting these choices all the time, you know, before I think I make a reference about, you know, before you marry the girl next door, that kind of thing. Whereas now, you can, I can literally go on my phone right now and just yes. go through hundreds and hundreds like and you're making these subconscious choices you know yeah. literally a second choice on a photo a name like the a line of information you're yeah. kind of saying yes or no to this person who you may like in real life you may not like in real life and yeah. it's this kind of weird concept which I don't it's strange and you know I, I think it's yeah. here to stay I don't think it's going anywhere and as you say certainly in COVID times when where else are people going to meet? You know, there's not yeah. going to be any office romances or you know, <laughs> going around and masks on. It's not really the same, is it? Um, I don't know, are you just... smiling? Are you just pleased to see me? I can't tell. <laughs> there's something really beautiful about Josh's journey that I think in modern societies, despite all the Tinder dates, it's not just that that's the only way you're going to find someone. There's also the opportunity that you could just stumble into them at, a, at an art gallery or a museum or, you know, wherever. So you stumble across someone I feel now people wouldn't even say anything. I feel people yeah. are now more likely, they'd probably get yeah. out their phone and search on Tinder, try and yeah. <laughs> meet them on there. Yeah, turn, like, your, turn your location <laughs> radius down to zero, exactly. and then exactly. they're the one, you match with them. Oh, I'll look through your Instagram first, <laughs> decide if I'm interested in you, and then maybe we can talk later, yeah. rather than, as you say, have the, the courage to talk there and then. What really comes across, particularly when I was reading the book, was how visual the writing is. Ultimately, I would imagine that you were thinking of putting this to a film. I'm certainly being influenced by film more than books. And I think I'm someone who's grown up, you know, I love the cinema. You know, I, I wasn't a huge reader growing up. I was, you know, someone who watched films more. Um, yeah. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to read more books now. Um, 
the semi- bookshelves in the background, I've just got to say, are <laughs> exactly. proof that you have read enough books to write a book. So, <laughs> Although this shelf is just DVDs, actually. That's DVDs, so, okay. <laughs> um, um, and, and this is all my book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The copies you and your family have bought. Yeah, cool. Exactly. Um, <laughs> um, no, to answer your question, yeah, I, I certainly wrote it hoping that it was, you know, obviously every author would love their book or most authors would love their book to become a film. And certainly it's no different. Yeah, we've had discussions with a few production companies about it. Um, and one of them is kind of ongoing right now. Um, I think for a book to be adapted is very hard in normal circumstances. You know, even once your book's optioned, I think it's only like a 10% um, success rate of it actually going from an option to being made in a normal year. In a year where film sets are very difficult right now, where films yeah. aren't being made. And are there plans for a sequel for the flip side? There weren't, but I have, I have seen a few people saying that there should be a sequel and um, requesting it. Um, <laughs> the way you set it up at the end, I think, personally, I thought it left it quite open for potential adaptation. Well, are we thinking he, he goes and he's... We, he, I was nearly going to give away. I was going to you were going to give away the ending. I was trying <laughs> so <laughs> hard not to. Like, if you want to, it's your book. But I was like, <laughs> I was we'll close. let people discover. Yeah, we say <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. And I know you said you're deep into writing your second novel. So tell us a bit, a bit about that one. Yeah, so I finished the first draft actually. So we're now in the editing phase of that. <laughs> Questioning <laughs> why I wrote this. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, so the second novel is. Um, it's about, this, I haven't practiced my elevator pitch. I haven't really told you right. a second novel yet. This is like, this, this is, is all exclusive. exclusive right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, Amazing. You heard it here first. I say I can't mention it, but you know, let's, no. on are the we, platform we, like this, let's, let's go we for it. Let's, <laughs> let's go for it. Wow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, sorry to the mail online who, you know, yeah. are going to get exclusive. It's coming yeah. here. So it's kind of split over two time periods. Um, so it's in 1975. And we've got three boys at a school, um, kind of unlucky in love, not the most popular boys. They have French pen pals. They end up going on this trip to see one of their pen pals in France. Um, the second part of the story is set in modern day um, and they undertake a similar journey and end up being maybe reunited with their pen pal. Um, I won't give away too much more, but it's a, it's a love story set over two time periods. For everyone who hasn't, had the joy of reading the flip side yet tell us where can we get our hands on this book so it's out now in on ebook um and audiobook and you can get that from the usual sources um if you would like the paperback copy that comes out november the 26th in the uk um and will be available in all good books <laughs> in all good bookstores um you've practiced this a, i like this <laughs> exactly if you're in the states it comes out november the 17th and then translations are going to follow in German in memory <laughs> exactly German <laughs> French Dutch Italian Serbian Hungarian Croatian Korean and one other language I've now forgotten we'll link everything in the video exactly Don't sorry for the country I've below. just ignored <laughs> they will have a huge following there I'm sure it once we remember it but we'll put it down in the comments below and once again, James, thank you so much for taking the time out to share this amazing insight and seriously wishing you all the very best with the book and your future writing. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much, Ed. 